Elizabeth Gaskell. Elizabeth Gaskell is equally well known as Mrs. Gaskell. When her mother died, she was three months old, and she was sent to live in Knutsford, Cheshire, with her aunt Hannah. This setting would become the basis for her novel Cranford. At twenty-two, she married and settled in Manchester to raise her family. Friends with Charlotte Bronte, she went on to write her biography, and was also highly regarded by a certain Charles Dickens, who published her ghost stories in his magazine. Much of her work views the emerging industrial society of Victorian England through her own moral and religious values, and has an uncanny ability to look at and report on the many strata of society. Sketches among the poor, by Elizabeth Gaskell. In childhood days, I do remember me of one dark house behind an old elm tree, by gloomy streets surrounded. Where the flower bought from the fresher air, scarce for an hour retains its fragrant scent. Yet men live there, yea, and in happiness. The mind doth clear in most dense airs its own bright atmosphere. But in the house of which I spake, there dwelt one by whom all the weight of smoke was felt. She had overstepped the bound twixt youth and age, a single, not a lonely woman, sage and thoughtful ever. Yet most truly kind, without the natural ties, she sought to bind hearts unto hers, with gentle, useful love, prompt at each change in sympathy to move, and so she gained the affection which she prized from every living thing, however despised, a call upon her tenderness, whene'er the friends around her had a grief to share, and if in joy the kind one they forgot. She still rejoiced, and more was wanted not. Said I not truly, she was not alone, though none at evening shared her clean hearthstone. To some she might prosaic seem, but me she always charmed with daily poesy. Felt in her every action, never heard, even as the mate of some sweet singing bird, that mute and still broods on her treasure nest, her heart's fond hope hid deep within her breast. In all her quiet duties, one dear thought kept ever true and constant sway, not brought before the world, but garnered all the more for being to herself a secret store. Whene'er she heard of country homes, a smile came brightening o'er her serious face the while. She knew not that it came, yet in her heart a hope leaped up, of which that smile was part. She thought the time might come ere yet the bowl were broken at the fountain. When her soul might listen to its yearnings, unreproved by thought of failure to the cause she loved, when she might leave the close and noisy street, and once again her childhood's home might greet, it was a pleasant place that early home. The brook went singing by, leaving its foam among the flags and blue forget-me-not, and in a nook above that sheltered spot, for ages stood a gnarled hawthorn tree. And if you passed in springtime, you might see the knotted trunk all coronalled with flowers, that every breeze shook down in fragrant showers. The earnest bees in odorous cells did lie, hymning their thanks with murmuring melody. The evening sun shone brightly on the green and seemed to linger on the lonely scene. And if to others Mary's early nest showed poor and homely. To her loving breast, a charm lay hidden in the very stains which time and weather left. The old dim panes, the grey rough moss, the house leak you might see were chronicled in childhood's memory, and in her dreams she wandered far and wide among the hills. Her sister at her side, that sister slept beneath a grassy tomb, ere time had robbed her of her first sweet bloom. Oh, sleep! That bringest back our childhood's heart, ere yet the dew exhale, the hope depart. Thou callest up the lost ones, sorrow o'er till sorrow's self hath lost her tearful power. Thine is the fairy land where shadows dwell, evoked in dreams by some strange hidden spell. But day and waking have their dreams, O、oh、sleep, when hope and memory their fond watches keep, and such or Mary held supremest sway. When kindly labours tasked her hands all day, employed her hands, her thoughts roamed far and free, till sense called down to calm reality. A few short weeks, 
and then unbound the chains which held her to another's woes or pains. Farewell to dusky streets and shrouded skies, her treasured home should bless her yearning eyes. And fair as in the days of childish glee, each grassy nook and wooded haunt should be. Yet ever, as one sorrow passed away, another called the tender one to stay. And where so late she shared the bright glad mirth, the phantom grief sat cowering at the hearth. So days and weeks passed on, and grew to years, unwept by Mary, save for others' tears. As a fond nurse, that from the mother's breast lulls the tired infant to its quiet rest, first stills each sound, then lets the curtain fall, to cast a dim and sleepy light over all. So age drew gently o'er each wearied sense, a deepening shade to smooth the parting hence. Each cherished accent, each familiar tone fell from her daily music, one by one. Still her attentive looks could rightly guess what moving lips by sound could not express. O'er each loved face next came a filmy veil, and shine and shadow from her sight did fail. And last of all the solemn change they saw, depriving death of half his regal awe. The mind sank down to childishness, and they, relying on her counsel day by day, as some lone wanderer from his home afar, takes for his guide some fixed and well-known star, till clouds came wafting o'er its trembling light, and leave him wildered in the pathless night. Sought her changed face with strange uncertain gaze, still praying her to lead them through the maze. They pitied her lone fate, and deemed it sad, yet as in early childhood was she glad. No sense had she of change or loss of thought, with those around her no communion sought. Scarce knew she of her being, fancy wild had placed her in her father's house a child. It was her mother sang her to her rest. The lark awoke her, springing from his nest. The bee sang cheerily the livelong day, lurking mid flowers wherever she did play. The Sabbath bell rang as in years gone by, swelling and falling on the soft wind's sigh. Her little sisters knelt with her in prayer, and nightly did her father's blessing share. So wrapped in glad imaginings, her life stole on with all her sweet young memories rife. I often think, if by this mortal light we e'er can read another's lot all right, that for her loving heart a blessing came, unseen by many, clouded by a name. And all the outward fading from the world was like the flower at night when it has furled its golden leaves and lapped them round its heart to nestle closer in its sweetest part. Yes, angel voices called her childhood back, blotting out life with its dim, sorrowy track. Her secret wish was ever known in heaven, and so in mystery was the answer given. In sadness many mourned her latter years, but blessings shone behind that mist of tears, and as the child she deemed herself she lies in gentle slumber till the dead shall rise.'